Okay, wonderful. <laughs> well, hello, my name is Robert Baines. I am the president and CEO of the NATO Association of Canada, a charitable nonprofit dedicated to informing Canadians about the value of security and the importance of NATO. Um, NATO is not something that most Canadians pay attention to, uh, certainly not on a daily or weekly basis, but it's the NATO Association's job to try to make sure that Canadians do consider it and consider security more generally. Um, what we have around us, the great country that we've built uh, after so much effort, uh, so many trials and uh, so much work is not something that comes naturally. It's something that requires constant maintenance and, and attention. And that's really what we have to pay attention to when it comes to security. Uh, so that's why the NATO Association does what it does. Uh, we've got three outstanding members uh, of our defense and security uh, community here today to discuss the NATO summit. So most Canadians will have heard today and yesterday uh, just a little bit more about NATO, and hopefully that'll help to uh, imbue the citizenry with uh, just a bit more appreciation for how valuable a tool it is uh, and just what it means to be part of this rules-based international order. Uh, I'm really, really thrilled to be able to talk about the uh, summit that happened in Lithuania. Uh, it was, by all accounts, a historic summit. Uh, they have been saying that for, I think, about the past 10 years. Uh, so uh, there's there's more and more of this. Uh, but it's it really was quite something to see. Uh, last minute agreements, hard bargaining uh, occurred. So I hope we can get into all of that, as well as several different announcements from the Canadian government in an attempt to make sure that uh, the rest of the world sees that we take security uh, seriously. Uh, that might be a bit of a challenge, uh, and I will have our three discussing partners uh, discuss what that means. Uh, but let me introduce everybody first of all. Uh, Anessa Kimball, she is an associate professor in the Department of Political Science, Faculty of Social Sciences, Director of the Center on International Security and Co-Director of Canadian Defense and Security Network, of which the NATO Association is a proud member. Uh, Professor Kimball also belongs to the Defense and Security Foresight Group. Uh, that's a North American team. Uh, she presents a future report on international security and U.S. foreign policy every other Friday morning on Quebec City Station Radio Urbane. Alexander Lanoska is an associate professor in the Department of Political Science and in the Balsili School of International Affairs at the University of Waterloo. Uh, he's an associate fellow at the UK-based Council on Geostrategy, as well as a senior fellow at the Ottawa-based Macdonald Laurier Institute. He's just finished off a year as visiting professor at the College of Europe, uh, Nitolin. Uh, terrific to have you here, Alex. And David Perry is the president of the Canadian Global Affairs Institute. He is the host of the weekly Defense Deconstructed podcast, an outstanding program, and author of multiple publications related to defense budgeting, transformation, and procurement. He is also a columnist for the Canadian Naval Review, a wonderful publication. He's also an adjunct professor at the Center for Mil Military and Strategic Studies at the University of Calgary and a research fellow of the Center for the Study of Security and Development at Dalhousie University. Uh, there is also more on all three of our panelists in the uh, comment section below on YouTube, so please do take a look at their full bios. Uh, but uh, suffice it to say, all three of them are veterans of the defense and security conversation uh, in Canada, and I'm honored and pleased to have them all here with us today. Uh, so why don't we start the conversation with uh, some scene setting. Um, uh, before we get into uh, kind of the uh, the nitty gritty of what can it means for Canada, I'd just like to, to see what all three of you thought overall of the uh, Vilnius Summit uh, and what were some of the main successes uh, that were brought about. Clearly there was the uh, in final allowing of uh, uh, the Swedish campaign for NATO membership by Turkey. Uh, Erdogan was doing some hard bargaining on Monday night, uh, and uh, there was great jubilation when uh, the Turkish announcement came out that they would be willing to uh, allow Sweden to join after all. Uh, of course, there was also lots of discussions about uh, new uh, defense plans, beefing up those plans, which is always important for NATO when we actually do something instead of just say things. Um, the uh, language about defense production, which uh, I know uh, David's very interested in, and logistics. So perhaps uh, we could just start off. Uh, Anessa, if you wouldn't mind uh, mentioning a few things about what you see as the great successes or uh, 
uh, the good outcomes of this summit? Well, to me, um, what I thought was quite interesting is that this was a summit in which we had probably the most non-NATO countries that were present. So I think this speaks to the fact that you know NATO has over the last you know five to ten years really been reaching out uh, to other parts of the world and other countries and trying to engage them. We we speak a bit about the Finns and the Swedes as having been long time kind of NATO global partners, and now they they're coming into the alliance. Um, and obviously, of course, that's a highlight as well. Um, the Swedes finally um, getting the go uh, from Turkey after some tough bargaining. I was also interested to see that there were some G7, um, you know, statements that came out and agreements that came out on the side. This would have very much been some kind of backdoor side bargaining. This was not expected at all. Um, certainly was not on any of the diplomatic radar that there would be G7 things coming out from a NATO summit. Um, and so I think that that's also interesting. Um, and, you know, finally, I think that uh, obviously we're going to talk a bit about Ukraine and what's going on with Ukraine and what the status is. You know, uh, I think the final language of the communique doesn't really shift very much from what the language of was from the Bucharest in 2008. Um, I think that uh, there are various reasons for that. I'm sure we'll talk about it later. But again, um, that's probably, you know, one of the things that was most watched. Um, given the fact that Zelensky, you know, um, was quite free to say things like absurd that there's no timeline. Um, and so, you know, I think that he is very much invoking that actor drama um, going on. David Perry, you're off the top. Thanks. Um, so I'd echo, uh, I think, uh, pretty much everything that Anessa outlined. Uh, I think particularly the, the presence of the Pacific members. Um, Definitely seeing an increase uh, closeness of ties there. I think uh, towards the end, in uh, I caught a little bit of Stoltenberg's uh, press conference referring to Japan as I think NATO's closest partner in the context of them not establishing the office or, or whatever those particular details are going to be, but in general talking about the, the closeness of those ties and extending um, the language in the communique to basically say that the security in the Indo-Pacific affects security in the Euro-Atlantic region, so strengthening that. Um, beyond that, uh, I'm a money guy, so the defense investment plan uh, I thought was particularly interesting to see um, a reinforcement, as you said, of 2% as a firm commitment, none of the kind of aspirational sort of weaselly wordy stuff from the Wales summit of aspiring to move towards 2% uh, and then spending 20% of your 2% of GDP on the equipment and R&D. We now have pretty clear cut um, and simple language that uh, 2% percent is the floor uh, for NATO members uh, and 20 percent of that two percent is spending going to research uh, and development related to, and the equipment itself um, that spending um, that's that's removed the ambiguity um, and we got there without uh, apparently a whole lot of back and forth remains to be seen what that actually means uh, in lieu of Canada having apparently made it clear that we don't have any intention of meeting the pre or prior pledge um, but I think um, certainly it's difficult now to say that there's ambiguity about what we've committed to because that language is pretty crystal clear. Um, and from my perspective, uh, the last, most of the rest of the stuff is, is hypothetical if you don't have the resources. So good that there's a, a clear discussion on the resourcing piece. Uh, and I think just as you sort of mentioned there, the some interesting stuff given the context heading into the summit, some controversy over the United States um, agreeing to give Ukraine um, artillery shells with cluster munitions in it, I think essentially because uh, we can't keep pace with the production of conventional fires uh, for their artillery needs. So the language in um, the communique about uh, a production action plan um, and industrial manufacturing, I think is important because I think the conflict has shown uh, a significant lack of preparedness on behalf of the entire alliance from a defense industrial base point of view to actually conduct uh, and engage in uh, conventional conflict at scale. Alex, uh, your first thoughts on what went right or what were you impressed with? I have the toughest assignment because I'm following David and Anessa. <laughs> they well, we haven't talked much about covered a lot of Turkey. the successes already. I suppose when I was hearing their responses, again, with which I agree uh, wholeheartedly, I, I still wonder what in 10 years time we'll remember of this particular summit. It does seem very evolutionary in terms of the steps taken to 
have 2% of the floor to ramp up ammunition production, to solidify ties with Ukraine, to get Sweden finally on board. Maybe that's the thing we'll remember. Um, nothing really stands out. That's not to say that none of the items that Anessa and David mentioned are important. They are obviously, obviously are very important, but I think these are all things that are more or less consistent with the trend lines that we've been seeing within the alliance. And indeed, when we think about these sorts of summits, a lot of the main decisions probably have taken place already. There's been a lot of bargaining that's been unfolding over the, uh, many of these issues uh, for months now. Some of these issues are ongoing. Uh, I think David mentioned the uh, plans for a liaison office in Tokyo, Japan. That was something in the ether for a while. There was no agreement on that, in part because of French opposition. But we might see an announcement later uh, this year to that effect. But those other um, issues, like those that relate to Ukraine's membership in NATO, um, ammunition production, and so forth, those are things that we've been already discussing for a while. And as such, I don't see the 2023 Vilnius summit as much of an inflection point. I know it's disappointed a lot of people uh, precisely because Ukraine uh, did not receive clear guidelines or an invitation for that matter to receive membership. Um, but again, uh, if there's one big positive takeaway, I think there are more and more countries that have warmed up to the very possibility of Ukraine membership in a way that I think is without precedent. So the trend lines in that regard are positive, even if the outcome of this particular summit uh, remains far short of what Zelensky and others would have desired. Well, just, just for a moment though, uh, perhaps I could get all of your thoughts on uh, Turkey's uh, willingness to have Sweden finally as, as a member. There are obviously some very public statements about what are the agreements, including uh, some always odd uh, cross-pollination between the EU and NATO, uh, supporting EU membership, et cetera. Um, but I'd just like to get your, your thoughts on, on that occurrence, uh, especially uh, on the eve uh, and uh, clearly what, what Erdogan must have been uh, uh, angling for. Uh, anyone? Including the F-16s, which uh, apparently in a totally unrelated uh, set of circumstances, they will now be able to acquire, which they've been trying to for some time. But the United States government uh, was uh, previously unprepared to do. So I think that's uh, pretty clearly uh, tied up with their uh, concurrence. I also saw some discussion earlier about Canada having made a change to exporting um, drone cameras, presumably for the BT-12. Uh, 12 uh, or whatever it is, the the turkish uh, export model there that was the subject of controversy over the last years but some back and forth and conflicting statements from uh various government officials about whether or not that had in fact uh, taken place or not um so it looks like potentially at least one if not two uh, arms exports were sort of the, the at least part of the quid pro quo for um turkey's acquiescence yeah and it seems sorry Anessa, go ahead well i would say the other thing that's also clear is that there's a um, there are statements about Swedish that, that Sweden is going to commit to invest in Turkey. We don't know what that's going to look like, but um, I mean, uh, you know, I was in Sweden, you know, less than two weeks ago and I was speaking with people um, and they understand that there, there's gonna, there was going to be a price tag and they were willing to put up a fairly significant amount uh, in terms of price tag for investment. And so we don't know what that's going to look like, but I think that that's going to be fairly substantial at the end of the day um, to move, you know, to 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 be able to have moved Erdogan uh, from what was a position that was relatively firm for. Um, I think the other thing that's also a bit in the mix uh, that didn't really come out, um, which we should be watching for, is the new common burden sharing agreement. Um, they decided to uh, put a pause on the negotiations, hoping to get Sweden in. Um, this is important because Sweden and Finland together could take as much of the burden as all of the other new CEE states have taken. So we're not talking about a small slice. This could be anywhere um, from seven to, I think seven would be maybe even on the low end. Um, and again, I was talking with the Sweden Finns, Swedes and Finns about that um, just two weeks ago, and they were smiling and saying, yeah, we know, we know. Um, and so I think that's the other thing we should be very much um, waiting to see what comes out on that end. Well, I do enjoy the, uh, in some ways, the, the way that this has illustrated 
both the uh, the regular kind of NATO consensus building is not you know, isolated in any way, shape or form, that there are always bilateral deals that happen on the outsides of these discussions. And that's really the way uh, that the sausage is made. And we very rarely see it. But uh, in this case, as David was mentioning, uh, the F-16s and perhaps those uh, cameras and uh, as you mentioned, the investment of Sweden into Turkey, those are some of those uh, side sweeteners that only happen through bilateral, uh, really heavy dealings. So it's kind of interesting to see because uh, that, of course, is going on with almost every line of the communique itself. We just don't see those uh, individual pieces of wrangling. Uh, Alex, any quick comments before we go on? I mean, Sweden was officially neutral, but it was always on our side. And indeed, during the Cold War, they would buy weapons from the United States. They more or less had said that they would align with NATO in the event of some sort of Soviet attack. Uh, since the end of the Cold War, they have stepped up defense cooperation with a select group of NATO countries. Uh, Finland has done more or less the same thing, perhaps much more aggressively with the goal of eventually entering into the alliance. And as such, on a technical side of things, their participation in NATO is beneficial, obviously, because they're on the Baltic Sea and their presence on the North Atlantic Council obviously removes some inefficiencies that previously had existed with them being uh, outside of the organization. Symbolically, I think it has a lot of heft because, again, those are countries seen as historically neutral. And so them now being part of the alliance is significant for intrinsic reasons. But in terms of defense technical cooperation, probably less than what people think, but I, that's not to take away uh, from the significance of their adhesion to the alliance. Perfect. Um, I did want to just move on, uh, just before we go on to some of the uh, issues and uh, uh, how shall we say, things that were left out of the summit. Uh, I did want to just see if any of you had any comments on uh, China's uh, kind of lack of prominence at, at this summit. Last year in Madrid, uh, the inclusion of, of China and a couple of paragraphs on China in the communique uh, was quite striking. Uh, the uh, the language that uh, is utilized in this communique seems to be a little more balanced as far as trying to seek to find a compromise or to find collaborative uh, endeavors while still you know clearly identifying that the China is against the rules-based international order. Uh, but just interested if any of you had, had uh, picked up on anything there. My sense is that the language about China was an attempt to try and smooth the way for that, the, the Japan liaison office. Um, you know, there is, a, there is a fear. And again, one of the things that they're still talking about is will this be an office that has defense attaches or will it be limited to pol pol political attaches, right? Um, the reason why France has blocked it is because there are some partners, including the US, that would like that office. It, of course, Japan as well would like that office to have defense attaches because uh, NATO is a defense and security organization. Um, and so I feel that, you know, that language was a little bit more trying to smooth over in intra alliances difference. Um, one thing that I would say that also surprised me a bit is that there wasn't very much on the Arctic uh, in that communique, given the fact that now uh, Sweden and Finland are in NATO and we have a block of seven countries uh, against Russia, basically in the Arctic Council, this kind of closes that loop. Um, and so that was also a little bit interesting to me. My sense on that, my take on that is that um, they were already kind of talking about Russia so much that maybe they, they they chose to not talk about that <laughs> so as to not you know uh, bring more of a response to them because obviously Russia feels that that's a reason that it wants to act in. Um, and what's really important now is that um, uh, Sweden and Finland both joining uh, effectively equals the icebreaker balance up there. Um, it mm. equals capacities to Russia. Uh, and so this is important for Canada particularly. Um, because of all of the partners up there, Canada has the weakest resources. Um, and so, um, again, uh, the other thing I think is that I've seen uh, quite clearly is uh, a relationship that is certainly growing between Canada and the Nordic countries um, in this last year, um, which I think is also um, extremely important for Canadian defense and security. Uh, David, Alex, any thoughts on that? Uh, 
I had not had a chance to do a, a detailed comparison, but I was struck, um, you know, you, you just, as you said, in a number of instances, we basically, um, the communique itemizes, China does the various and following uh, things we don't like that are bad, um, comma, however, we're open to constructive engagement or words to that effect. Um, I think maybe there's a bit of a sense in some places that uh, uh, seeing what's coming from Washington, that there is probably a need to, to at least keep open some lines of communication and engagement, or at least put that out uh, in some circumstances. But it is kind of a, a striking um, itemization of a, sort of a, an airing of a grievances, but also, um, but we'd right. also be quite open to uh, collaboration. Yeah. Uh, Alex, any thoughts or? Uh... Yeah, I mean, so to build on what Anessa said, um, southern flank countries might feel like there could be too much focus on Russia. Uh, there's all that talk on the Arctic too. Uh, they already feel a little left out, a little alienated by the Russia focus since 2014. So I imagine that has something to do with it, but that, that just builds on what uh, she said. I also think that um, there's still some hope, perhaps a naive hope that China could put some pressure on Russia to come to certain terms with respect to Ukraine. And so they do not want to embrace overly tough language um, vis-a-vis China, so as not to alienate it. Fair enough. Okay, so let's move to the fun stuff. What what was left out and what, uh, Alex, you've already mentioned that. I know uh, uh, you you were concerned about the leaving out of, uh, of Tokyo specifically. Do you want to just articulate a bit more about um, that challenge when, when NATO is trying to stabilize the Indo-Pacific? uh and, and what that challenge was with with uh, uh with france yeah i i i think anessa covered it really really well so i don't want to retread it um i don't actually have anything to add but it does seem that the alliance may yet make a decision that will be positive in this particular direction uh later this year and indeed that's kind of how the alliance functions it does make decisions about making decisions later we saw that in 2008 with some negative consequences to be sure. And perhaps we're seeing that now, uh, not just on the issue of the liaison office, but maybe on uh, Ukraine's data membership more generally again. Uh, so that more or less is par for the course as regards to how NATO functions. I suppose the biggest thing that was actually wholly absent from even the agenda was the NATO Russia founding act itself. I was right. struck by how absent it was in even the lead up to the summit. and. As for those observers of this webinar who are unaware, the 1997 NATO Russia Founding Act was supposed to be a framing document that would set the parameters for how the two sides would cooperate and collaborate even in the context of NATO enlargement. And uh, one stipulation of the Founding Act was that there'll be no uh, permanent of combat forces stationed on new NATO territories, those territories east of Germany. And so we've had to design the enhanced forward presence in the Baltic countries, Poland, and now Southeastern Europe around those parameters, keeping them largely on a rotational basis. And that is all due to us abiding by the letter and the spirit of the NATO-Russia Founding Act. Germany announced not that long ago that was willing to host some sort of permanent uh, brigade uh, level uh, presence in Lithuania, which suggested um, an, a break with the NATO Russia Founding Act, but we have not seen any language to that effect either in the lead up or in the communique itself, which suggests that despite everything that's been going on over the course of the last 500 or so days, to say nothing of the last nine years, the NATO Russia Founding Act remains official policy. Yeah, that is quite strange and frustrating. Obviously, some of the uh, allies must feel that uh, that it would not be advantageous to go there, uh, yeah. even though our, yeah. our own contributions to Latvia could, you know, definitely be improved it was a, if it was an actual posting as opposed to a rotation. Right. Well, what I would just say there is that what seems to be particularly jarring is that the opposition to dismissing the Founding Act seems to come from the United States. Our good friends. All right. Um, well, let's just interject. Sorry, go ahead, Anessa. Sorry. That it's also clear that the U.S. has gotten around that with what they did bilaterally in Poland, and this is also looking to be what Canada is going to do. Um, Canada has last indicated that it's going to do something more permanent, which I have frankly recommended a couple months ago um, in Latvia. 
And, you know, the Canadian, I mean, the Americans now have Poznan, which is no longer a forward base. It's actually, it's an, it's an American base. There's 10,000 troops there. Um, and so uh, this doesn't break the spirit of the founding act. Um, and so I think we're going to see these side bargains maybe more and more bilaterally. And then, you know, EFP will kind of keep its kind of rotational uh, multinational presence going on. Yeah. But and that's, that's what makes the whole, whole thing so weird, right? Both Germany and the United States are doing things that seem to be in violation of the NR, NRFA. And yet those are the countries that are most in opposition to dispensing with it altogether. I find that weird. And I'm not entirely clear why that's the case. But it's technically not a violation if you read those agreements. Yeah, but sure. But from Russia's perspective, I mean, I'm it's kind of like. So, like, the agreements are very clear that they're not violating that act. I mean, they actually refer to other things in terms of their establishment. So, of course. So, like, I, I understand it's maybe a symbolic violation, but uh, as per legal, then I would say probably not. Yeah, no, I would agree with that. Uh, David, I just I think uh, at least for some countries, certainly Canada, I don't think there was much enthusiasm for establishing anything permanent um, because of all the kind of institutional linkage and complication that would come uh, with making it an actual uh, base facility. It was a lengthy process to to get us out of Germany. There was a whole hangover from that, and I don't think there was a lot of eagerness to to get back into that. So, aside from the adhering to the technicalities of that, I think there's also um, there's uh, some convenient alignment of at least some interest in, in doing what we're looking to do, which is to basically, I think, be circling and uh, cycling through uh, troops, pre-positioning equipment. Um, uh, I mean, I think it's going to be a little bit uh, interesting if we get down the road and there's there's more Canadian heavy armor in uh, Latvia, as an example, than remains in Canada, which I think is a distinct possibility within the next five years. Um, but we don't technically have any permanent basis there. We just happen to leave all our gear there and, and rotate the people through to use it. Um, but, uh, you know, that's, so I think there's some alignment there that's not just technical adherence to the parameters of the Russia uh, previous Russia agreements. Yeah, and it's a good point because we have to build less amenities. We wouldn't have to worry quite so much about building homes for uh, permanent uh, uh, soldiers there and their families. That would make yeah. a big difference. Uh, okay, well, let's just uh, hop on to the fun subject of uh, the Ukraine NATO Council and uh, Ukraine's membership bid. Um, what, if anything, did this actually uh, change uh, from 2008 Bucharest to the invitation? Um, uh, how, how do we interpret this, uh, this uh, announcement of, of Ukraine now not having to fulfill a membership action plan, but instead having to work, I gather, with the uh, NATO Ukraine Council in fulfilling those aspects? Uh, uh, anybody have any first thoughts on that? Anessa, all right. I can go. Um, so, um, of course, this um, Ukraine has already had membership action plans. I'm not sure if our audience knows that. Um, and so that's one thing that's very clear. Um, and the membership action plans that Ukraine has had and their evaluations have not necessarily been entirely favorable. So this could be a strong reason why they're not giving them a membership action plan. Another reason, which I think is important, is that these membership action plans actually take about a year to negotiate because it requires an evaluation of various things, and they have a duration of two years. Um, and then they would be reevaluated to determine whether or not membership is going to be offered. I think them not giving a plan is a way to not tie their hands to any particular path um, because it would be difficult to pull back an action plan. Um, and of course, now that we've talked about it so much, a lot of people would want to look at that membership action plan. Um, and of course, as somebody who has examined these things, I can tell you that they are not very available for lots of reasons, because when you read them, they don't make things look very nice. Um, and so I think that that's the other thing that a lot of people don't know <laughs> about these membership action plans is they're actually quite critical and quite detailed to the point where they actually go through and they will say, this law is currently contradicting this EU law and you have to change it. I don't think the Ukraine would like to open up everything at that point to that level. 
And so that's one thing that I that nobody is talking about, which I think is extremely important. Um, and then the other thing is not doing this, frankly, gives NATO a greater margin of maneuver down the road, right? They can make decisions later. It doesn't tie their hands to one path or another. another. They can see how things will kind of unfold. Um, and some of these things that would be in membership action plans have now are will be taken up a bit by this council. Um, and so to the extent to which these are going to be complements or substitutes, it is not entirely clear. Gotcha. Uh, David? I guess, uh, so I don't know a lot about the intricacies of the membership action plan and exceedance, but I guess if I understand the issue broadly, we're not prepared to actually let them in until the open and hot hostilities at least cool off to something more manageable. At that point, Ukraine will have basically massively degraded the Russian army and fought them to a loss of varying, I mean, there'd be different ways to interpret that. And at that point, I think I have a difficult time figuring out what kind of bureaucratic pecuniary uh, restrictions we would use to not allow them membership. If that's kind of the scenario, like you get to the point where the active hostilities have stopped, I mean, they've already basically by if most of the reporting is accurate they've they've taken out um in the last 500 days something like half of the russian army's combat capability i think it'd be difficult to look at them and then say yeah we're not we don't think you're good enough uh, for membership alex i i've been thinking for a while that ukraine will become a member of nato once it no longer needs nato and right. i think unfortunately it's in that sort of situation where if it does succeed in liberating most, if not all of its territory under Russian occupational control, um, Russia will be at a point where it simply cannot muster sufficient military forces to pose much of a threat, at least into the short and medium term. And as such, it'd be kind of moot uh, in terms of having the security guarantee offered by NATO, which again is against Russia. Uh, so Ukraine's in this paradoxical situation where it has to prove itself that it can defeat Russia in order to join an alliance that's in, primarily intended to deter Russia from attacking in the first place, uh, a situation that obviously is max of deterrence failure. Um, and so Ukraine has uh, unfortunately few good options. I don't think Ukraine actually did that badly. I know quite a few of my colleagues are very disappointed with the lack of an extent of any sort of invitation or clarity on the conditions set forth as to when or how Ukraine could join uh, the alliance. Uh, it's, there is that, now that council. Um, there, is, uh, there is a set of pledges for ramping up the uh, ammunition production as well as for expanding uh, military assistance to Ukraine. Certainly ties between NATO and Ukraine are only going to get uh, closer and closer. Um, it might not necessarily go in the, to the speed desired by Kyiv, but I think the trend lines nevertheless are very positive. There could have been some better messaging uh, about what we could expect reasonably from the NATO summit. Uh, and I think um, there has unfortunately been this tendency to overstate the impact of certain things in the short term, the NATO summit and Ukraine being one thing, the counteroffensive, as a matter of fact, being the other thing. And so some people might be reeling from those mismanaged expectations, but all things considered, Ukraine is still on a good trajectory. And indeed, I wanna underline the point that more and more countries within the alliance seem to be warming to the possibility, at least, of Ukraine becoming a member in, way, in a way that was simply not even considered possible or even plausible uh, not uh, that long ago. Yeah, well, it does show you the remarkable, uh, what shall we say, erosion power that consensus has, uh, that slow building up of, uh, of agreement uh, in certain ways. So uh, certainly very interesting to see that. Um, and perhaps I'd just uh, like to move a little bit more. Uh, Canada has always supported uh, Ukraine's membership and has for a long time. The uh, Prime Minister just put out uh, another uh, support uh, release uh, that uh, Canada does support Ukraine's membership in the alliance. Um, but the NATO alliance is always uh, there, sorry, NATO summit is always an interesting uh, moment for Canada. Uh, Canada obviously has not been reaching anywhere close to 2% GDP uh, defense spending, which is what we were supposed to be aspiring to, even though the Prime Minister said there's no chance that we would ever be getting there. Uh, 
Um, and uh, the, the, I think the most recent number was 1.22% of GDP, which came out, I believe, on Friday or Monday, uh, which is was great news just before the NATO summit. Um, but uh, over the past month, there have been at least, I think, three separate announcements, including uh, the one on Tuesday and the one today from the Canadian government about support uh, for NATO and Ukraine and Latvia, uh, the 15 uh, Leopard tanks, of course, um, the uh, specifics about what our contribution to the Enhanced Forward Presence Brigade is actually going to look like, and now today, uh, further announcements of support for Ukraine. Um, so, I mean, the NATO alliance has always been the flag bearer uh, of kind of the rules-based international order and perhaps the, one of the prime uh, exemplars of that whole idea of non-zero-sum uh, collaborative problem-solving and, and uh, maintaining uh, multilateral uh, decision-making. Uh, so the fact that Canada has made these three announcements is perhaps not that surprising. I'd just like to get uh, your your thoughts on the three different announcements or, or just all taken all together. Um, a, what, what kind of balance are we at now? This new requirement for 2% uh, GDP in the communique and that being the floor, which has been the language that has been uh, discussed at least for the past four or five months constantly by the Secretary General and other NATO members. Um, what does that mean for Canada? Are, are we going to have, is this enough? I, I would su suggest not, but uh, I'd just be curious to know what you think um, is the future as far as Canada's, uh, uh, we, we signed it. So we must be trying to build a, uh, uh, a roadmap of some kind. A any thoughts? Any of you, who, who would you like to jump in? David Barry. Well, uh, so I guess I think there's a couple of things. Um, it's not just that we're at 1.22, but that, that shares declined net in the last several years. So that's, we're heading into the the summit with, uh, if you're measuring constant dollars and just looking at those charts, I mean, th that those figures have stayed relatively constant. There's been some marginal increase in the last six years, but as a share of GDP, we've we've dropped from close to 1.4 to 1.22. Um, I have stopped really looking at and putting much stock in the estimates for the current year because those don't tend to bear out all that well. Um, so the trajectory has been one that's gone down recently. Um, we've also slipped from six to seventh in terms of how much we spend in absolute terms if the 2023 estimates bear out. And in part of that, there's you know like almost a doubling in what Poland's um, looking to spend, which would put them marginally ahead of the uh, where we are for this year, again, if the estimates bear out, which is always a little dubious, especially for a country like Poland, which is looking to effectively double their spending. That's a pretty massive jump to do in one year. So we'll see how that plays out. But that, I think, for a while would repeatedly see references to Canada, um, you know, kind of being in that position in absolute terms. And in, uh, in the prime minister's presser today he made reference to Canada having one of the most significant absolute dollar increases since 2014, uh, which I thought was interesting as language I hadn't heard um, any Canadian officials say. And I, like, there's a couple different ways to measure that. And I think depending on what numbers you're looking at, it's either like the third or the fourth uh, or fifth uh, most significant absolute dollar increase uh, since 2014, uh, which is a different positioning. Um, I did note that the very clear language in the uh, communique that said you know without ambiguity we will meet two percent did not include any nuancing about spending on ai or cyber or quantum and any of the different things that the canadian government was trying to position as sort of uh what we should be included in there and um i believe i heard stoltenberg in his press conference uh when asked about what what was basically included make reference to the fact that it's the same formula we've been using um i'd have to check that because it was uh, uh in a live transcript as i was doing something else um so i think that's just some context but you know to your point we clearly like we're nowhere close to hitting this we've been going in the opposite direction uh and nothing that the prime minister announced uh, today or in the last couple of days will move this needle at all um because i'm not sure how much any of it is actually new money alex anessa 
Um, so my take on it is uh, a little bit more varied. So one thing we're starting work on now, um, those of us that are burden sharing scholars, is um, looking at NATO standard units. The difference is when you look at NATO standard units to measure contributions, it accounts for purchasing power parity. And this is where Canada gets punished more or less. Um, and so I have a colleague and I were working on how this would recast burden sharing if we actually use a standardized unit as opposed to GDP. Um, spending, which we already know, um, because countries put different things into this, this means that some countries can artificially look like they're doing better than they actually are. The country we often point the finger at is Greece there. Um, so that's one thing. Um, the second thing is that, um, you know, the 2% is, it became a norm to become a target in a commitment over a long period. Um, and from the viewpoint of most of the countries in Central and Eastern Europe, this was an informative signal to them, right, all around Article 3, right? You have to be able to have this level of national capability, but also contribute. Um, and so it became 2%. Um, and that particular measure, for a couple of reasons, and most of these um, were related to essentially U.S. politics, um, and then the Americans kind of became the people that, you know, said, this is what we want. This is what we have to have. Um, and so when that 2% came out in 1997, 98, we have to remember that this was about countries joining NATO. This wasn't really about the countries that were already in NATO. Um, so that's the other another thing to consider when we talk about this 2%. Um, the final thing is that um, for most of the people that I have spoken to here um, in Central and Eastern Europe, 2% is all great, but they really care about what's going on in enhanced forward presence and that Canada is pulling its weight there. Um, and so frankly, um, one thing that I think we should say is very clear is that um, Canada's now contribution in leading um, in, in Latvia is equal to the contributions of leaders like the U.S., like France, so countries that have a much larger military. Um, it also is worth being said that Canada leading that brigade um, has the most nationalities and the most languages um, of all of them and the most heterogeneity among the capacities of all of the partners. And I know this because I've actually looked at all of those countries and every other brigade and looked how close. And so what you have is you have all of the other brigades with states that have much closer types of capabilities. And then Canada has this big amalgamation that it's managing. Um, and so under the circumstances, I think we can say, how is Canada doing what it's able to do with 1.22? Not why is it not at 2%? Um, I think that that's the thing. And, you know, frankly, um, you know, I've been spending, I've spent uh, a while in the Czech Republic and, you know, the Czechs are extremely impressed by the Canadians and what Canada can do with the size of what it has of its military. And I think that's the other thing that we often don't talk about is that the size of Canada's military is not that big. What would you spend on if you had if you went to two percent? You can't have people have like six guns, you know. This is so like again. There's a little bit of a there's a plateau in terms of the capacity that you could actually invest. Um, and as we know, the can Canadian public is not necessarily going to be um, very psyched about, for example, um, investing in hugely technological equipment that could have many risks in development given what we know about the procurement process. Then of course, that's, Dave knows far more about that and the technicalities, but I will say that um, there's also a bit of the like, could we even do it reasonably and effectively um, at this point? So I'd just say before I ask Alex, uh, uh, that you know, seems so strange. Uh, I mean, uh, I've heard very similar things about the uh, uh, contributions and capabilities as opposed to the cash. Uh, aspect. I mean, that that language was dropped years ago, and it's it is surprising that Canada. I mean, maybe Canada did fight a little bit uh, to try to get that language uh, into the communique, but it is somewhat surprising because, uh, I, I, as I think most of the people here would would agree, uh, if you are going to agree to two percent, you have to have a plan to get there. You can't just sign on to something like this and then ignore it. That's that's just not that's not helpful. Uh, so I think uh, I do hope, Anessa, that they will be uh, that the Canadian government will be fighting to have uh, some different way of measuring, as you say. Uh, Alex, any points on this? Uh, 
I personally don't mind the 2% rule. Uh, I used, I mean, yes, it's arbitrary. It was pulled from a hat. Uh, it became uh, a norm first, and then an ironclad commitment that was not at all enforced whatsoever, uh, even though maybe behind brown door, uh, uh, behind uh, closed doors, certain leaders get brown for not living up to those commitments. Uh, at the end of the day, um, defense outputs are best predicted by defense inputs, and money is just one of those things. Uh, and so as much as it is true that Canada is pulling its weight, perhaps more so than a lot of other NATO allies, precisely because it is a framework nation in Latvia, um, it's also true that those troops in Latvia have suffered from equipment shortfalls. And that's an artifact of us just not spending that much. Um, you know, there was even a news story earlier this year about how Canadian soldiers were literally buying gear from their Danish counterparts or having to go on Amazon to buy um, uh, vests or night goggles. Um, we did have to pull out of the air policing mission from Romania precisely because we could not sustain that um, level of commitment. Uh, so uh, yeah, I think we do a lot that's very, very good for the Alliance. And uh, in some respects, just by focusing on the GDP, metric we overlook what we are doing in that respect but at the same time um, it, it is true that those countries that are spending more on their defense are also the ones that are providing more to ukraine precisely because they have the stocks available to do so they have the wherewithal to do so without necessarily compromising the readiness um, and, and so uh, i don't see canada necessarily going to two percent that's a floor or whatever um, or even having major upticks uh, in defense spending for the reasons that David and Essa uh, would tell you. But I, I do think it's still an important and informative metric, albeit one that we cannot necessarily take too, too seriously, precisely because it is a little arbitrary and, um, and so forth. It's ultimately heuristic, but I think still one that uh, is important all the same. Terrific. Okay. Well, I did want to see uh, uh, if we have any extra questions on YouTube. If you do have any questions, uh, we have about 15 minutes left. Um, please do uh, pop them in the chat. We do have one from uh, Matthew. Um, does the seeming French willingness to signal decision-making sovereignty uh, show any cracks in the alliance? Um, I gather that must mean that uh, the, the French willingness to uh, kind of veto the the uh, Tokyo office. I'm not sure if anybody has any uh, thoughts on that, but I mean, uh, the interesting dynamic of, of, of sovereignty for NATO has always been its its flexibility to allow states within it to, to disagree and pretty much have a veto over everybody else. But Alex, did you have something to mention there? I mean, the Washington Treaty reinforces state sovereignty, despite the alliance being, well, perhaps precisely because the alliance is a collective defense organization. Uh, it is mindful of every state's sovereignty. That's why it's uh, a consensus driven organization. And the French have had disputes with NATO in the past. They're gonna have disputes with NATO in the present and they're gonna have disputes with NATO in the future. Um, I think this particular dispute over the liaison office in Tokyo is very minor, all things considered. Um, and it'll probably be one that will be resolved uh, in one form or another in the coming uh, months. Yeah, certainly. I did want to actually ask uh, uh, before, if there we're waiting for any other questions, I did want to uh, ask, uh, Anessa, I should have mentioned your book, Beyond 2%, of course. Uh, congratulations again on that. Uh, but you have been visiting all of our centers of excellence, NATO centers of excellence. There are, what, 32 of them? Uh, you're not visiting all, all of them, I'm sure, but um, do you mind just talking a little bit about that? And, and uh, of course, we're going to get our own center of excellence that's being set up. Uh, that might be a, a great uh, kind of update from you, if you wouldn't mind. Sure. Um, so for those of us, those in the audience that don't know exactly what a center of excellence is, um, centers of excellence are peacetime military establishments. And so think a bit of a mashup of a kind of an academic think tank meets uh, professional military education um, and they had this hybrid baby. Um, and so um, what is interesting is that um, there are actually 28 established centers, um, mostly in Europe. Canada um, has 
um, committed to host what should be the 30th. The 29th is on space and it's to be hosted by France and it is um, uh, bogged down in politics, one might say. Um, and so huh, we've been watching that, but it very, very well may be the case that uh, the, the, the Climate Change and Security Center of Excellence will stand up in Montreal before the space one does in Toulouse. Um, and so what is interesting about these uh, institutions is that they are designed to help NATO transform for the future. Um, and so they don't, they are not part of the NATO command structure in any way. Um, states contribute to these, and in fact, state contributions to these cannot count as their contributions to NATO. Um, and so again, um, the whole concept was to allow countries to try to share burdens in different ways and also give them more options. So we might understand, for example, that um, participating in a center of excellence is maybe less politically risky um, than going into an actual operation where soldiers might be shot. Um, also, these things uh, serve very much to, um, some of them are very, the, the first ones came out of kind of the classic military professions, such as explosive ordnance disposal, uh, CBRN. Um, and so some of these centers are very much about kind of preserving those professions and they actually train and certify people. Other ones like strategic communications and energy, energy security are these kind of second wave ones that are much more complicated issues that include what we call some of these soft uh, security issues. Um, and so cl uh, the climate security one is really going to cut right in the middle of these because it does have some of these very soft security issues. But at the end of the day, militaries are the largest polluters on the planet. Um, and so frankly, to mitigate climate change, it will require militaries to change their behaviors, adapt behaviors, and do various things differently. Um, and so how this is going to happen and how Canada can lead this is frankly fascinating. Um, the second thing that I find also quite interesting is that some centers enlarge. And so, for example, um, STRATCOM has partners that are non-NATO partners, has partners in Asia. Um, but it started out with a core of six states, and now it's got 33 partners, more than NATO, <laughs> right? Um, and so the Canadian Center will likely start um, with a group of probably five to eight partners. I have a good idea of what these states will be. They're going to be some of the Nordic states, probably Italy, um, the UK, um, and then the Americans, of course. And then from there, you know, it'll be up to Canada in some senses to try to collaborate and lead this thing and bring other states into the center if they would like to, to kind of, um, you know, figure out how NATO might be able to actually, you know, affect uh, climate change and, you know, really focus on the importance of the military doing their part. Um, and so um, I'm here in Eastern Europe and I'm gonna be going to at least six centers of excellence to conduct interviews, to learn all about them. Um, and so, frankly, I think it's going to be very interesting to see uh, what it's going to look like um, in Montreal. And frankly, it's supposed to stand up in Montreal before the end of this year. Um, it's scheduled for November. So we better be watching. Terrific. Well, I'm always uh, always pleased to hear about some of the initiatives uh, that NATO is uh, gearing towards when it comes to things like climate security, because it is forward looking. It is trying to meet uh, the future uh, challenges uh, before they're actually knocking on the door. Of course, they are in some cases. <laughs> We've been paying attention to the air quality. Um, but perhaps uh, just a quick sum up then from each of you. Uh, what is uh, the most urgent thing for NATO to be tackling right now? What is what is the, the real, uh, what must be the concentration of the alliance uh, at the moment? Is it is it spending? Is it making sure that Ukraine just wins the war and we get as much uh, uh, kit to them as possible, um, or is it also just concentrating on our own members to make sure that they do uh, push through with defense uh, and defense spending? Uh, David, you've got your microphone off already. What's what's your what's your take? So I'd say probably uh, not the most urgent, but I think the most important long term is uh, sorting out some of the defense industrial base and the logistical preparation. Uh, I think the last 500 days have shown that pretty clearly the West is not prepared for large scale conventional conflict um, unless it ends in a week. Uh, and if anything on the scale of what we've seen in, in Russia right now, we do not have the defense industrial uh, preparedness um, 
capacity uh, even to create stockpiles in the short term, um, let alone longer down the road. And correcting that, I think, is something that uh, we need to actually spend some time collectively engaging in. Alex? I, this probably will not surprise anyone who knows me or my work, but I would suppose uh, the most urgent task is to do defeat Russia on the battlefield and to have Ukraine liberate uh, as much, if not all of its territory from Russian occupational control. Uh, so long as Russia is aggressing against Ukraine, the manner that it has, uh, the eastern flank will always be very insecure and the potential for spillover will exist. Um, and I think, you know, there have been sound arguments for why NATO countries have been hesitant in providing certain weapon systems, but I think we've learned enough now about so-called Russian red lines, as well as the ability of Ukrainian armed forces to integrate certain weapon systems that our confidence should increase. I have in mind such systems like ATACMS, which would be certainly very useful uh, in the counteroffensive. I also think, though, there could be still some better messaging that these sorts of military operations are extremely difficult. And one thing that Ukraine does relatively well is to conserve its forces, unlike Russia. Uh, but that means that it's not going to take as many risks on the battlefield as, say, Russia. And so we're going to have to be a little patient. I think there were uh, all sorts of jacked up expectations as to the Ukrainian counteroffensive. Some of it was fueled by Ukrainians themselves. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, we are seeing progress on the battlefield, but it's happening slowly in part because Russia is well entrenched and well fortified. It's still Russia. It's not the ISIS. It's not the Taliban. Um, and so I, th I think that's the core problem right now. And everything else is very important too, but I think it's ultimately secondary at this particular stage or subordinate to that particular problem. I mean, I would go with, of course, you know, um, deterrence and collective defense are, are kind of the heart um, of, of the alliance. Um, but I think that what we have seen now is that, you know, NATO's lack of attention to crisis prevention and crisis management, its other mandates, um, has really contributed to the situation that we're in now. Um, and I think, frankly, this touches also, you know, Dave's point about the defense industrial base, base, you know, this is a crisis that's coming at us very quickly. Um, and, you know, uh, NATO is not, uh, it has not reflected on it appropriately. The partners have not kind of collaborated in thinking about how they're going to overcome this. Um, and, you know, Canada, as we know, uh, frankly, often has, you know, does a little bit of the ostrich with putting its head in the ground and watching to see what other partners will do and then kind of following up. Canada is not really known for, you know, being innovative or, or thinking outside of the box on any of these things. And we know for sure, um, based on comments from Wayne Iyer that, you know, Demeral Iyer, that, you, you know, we are, we are in a bad position now. We have, frankly, given out a lot of our capacity. We have put, pushed a lot forward in Latvia. We have donated a lot. Um, and, you know, we're kind of living on you know, our, the national defense is a bit on fumes if we actually had to, you know, defend the territory of Canada. Um, and so I think that there's also a bit of a reflection that needs to be done um, in terms of, you know, balancing out, uh, you know, what does it mean to be a good, credible partner, but also ensure Canada itself is protected from threats that might come to it, at it, and arrive there. Um, so that, that would be my two cents. Well, just that. That's all we have to do. Great. Well, I'm glad all three of you have uh, given us some good, good ideas for what the roadmap should be on the way forward. Uh, obviously, all three of you are intimately uh, connected with the task of making sure the Canadian public are aware of these issues. So I thank you so much on behalf of the NATO Association. Um, we really need as many voices as possible pushing this message out. Uh, so thanks so much. Um, uh, Anessa Kimball, Alexander Lenovska, David Perry, uh, a real pleasure. Um, and for those who are watching, thank you so much for being involved in this conversation. Please continue to, uh, to talk to your community, talk to your members of parliament, make sure that they know that you are concerned about security, that it's something we can't take for granted. Uh, and uh, as always, please uh, feel free to uh, uh, follow all of the different organizations we're involved with here. Um, uh, but for the NATO Association, I'm Robert Baines. Thank you so much all for joining us. Uh, it's been a true pleasure. Thanks a lot. Thanks.